Our scripture reading this morning, <clears throat> this morning comes from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. At this time, we will have our special meeting. today is extra special because it is the debut of an original composition of our own, one of our own choir members, Maria. So uh, this is a labor of love. I helped her uh, write parts for the choir so that we can sing it as a group. And I'm going to let her introduce it, talk about her inspiration for this song. so that's why we don't have a, a full choir uh, with us today uh, because she is unfortunately planning and moving next month and so we will be without her and her son Irvin but we just wanted to present her with this we all signed a copy of her original uh, piece and we just signed it from the choir so we just wanted to present this to her A friend of mine had a dream not very long ago. And um, in this dream, he said that he was inside a, like a living room. Um, and he saw a group of people. And uh, at the moment, he said that he heard a voice coming from the ceiling, from up there. So. He raised up his head and he saw that there was no ceiling on the on the room. And so he his eyes went up all the way up to heaven. And then he saw two hands coming down. Actually it was one hand coming down and offering him two books. And these are the two books that came down to him. And the boys told them, go tell the people about this. Go talk to them about, about this. And so he said, but people don't wanna, don't wanna know from this. They don't, they don't wanna hear it. And uh, he said, the boy said, go tell them, they want to hear. So in the people there in the living room, um, they, they turned around and they said, they were listening. So they said, yes, yes. And one of the people was me there. So I took, I took the, the message as well, um, who was, they, he shared the, the, you know, the two books with me and with the other ones there, but also I felt the responsibility to share with others what the Lord has given us. This is, this is so amazing because when you read the Bible, you see the, um, the relevance that uh, we have in these two books. The Holy Bible, the Word of God. But it starts telling us about this great controversy that, are, that happened here in earth by accepting um, the rebellion to God. And it ends telling us a beautiful story, beautiful story about um, about 
Jesus, how Jesus overcoming sin. And this is the continuation. It tells us the great controversy is part of it. And so that's the, the Lord telling us and reminding us, you know, I've given you these, just go share it. So my inspiration was actually uh, my redeemer, our re redeemer. So we go back to the Bible, we go back to great controversy, and we see that our Redeemer, um, throughout the song, you can hear is Jesus at the beginning, and then at the end, he is crowned, crowned with glory, and we are there. Revelation 7 9 says, And beyond is a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Their warfare is ended, their victory won. The redeemed raise a song of praise that echoes and re-echoes through the vaults of heaven. In the presence of the assembled inhabitants of earth and heaven, the final coronation of the Son of God takes place. <coughs>
God is good. Can you say amen? Amen. It's 12.05. If you had plans at 12, you're going to be late. <laughs> Whatever you had planned. <clears throat> now, God is good. We're going to, um, I'm just going to take a breath here, okay? That was a powerful song, by the way. Um, thank you. Yeah, God is good, isn't he? Yeah, can't wait to see that day where Jesus is crowned King of Kings. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. We're gonna um, we're gonna hang out in First Samuel today. We we've been kind of doing a slow walk through First Samuel together, and uh, the last time we were with Samuel, um, he was he was witnessing something he had never experienced, and that was direct communication from God. The Lord was literally calling his name, speaking to him personally and directly. God was speaking to this man child, to this boy really and he was he was calling to him and because he didn't know the lord yet he didn't recognize the lord's voice he ran to eli you remember the story he ran to eli did that three times before eli really understood what was going on and um, i think it may be ironic at least that god calls to this boy this this little boy samuel and he actually has to run to the high priest who frankly wasn't really living up to his calling as high priest um, Eli wasn't correcting his own erring children. He himself had not been diligent in his work for God. Um, so he hadn't heard from God in a while. And it, and it took three times of Samuel coming to him and saying, you called me before Eli even realized what was going on. It, it kind of gives you a sense that, that Eli wasn't expecting to hear from God. I can tell you that in that very part of that story, God shows his patience. By calling to Samuel again and again and again and again. And I'm thankful for one, that God is patient with us. Aren't you thankful for that? That, that God doesn't give up after he calls us one time. He calls to us again. And again and again, the Lord continues to call after us. And so today we're going to linger a little bit behind the veil, as it were. And, um, and we're going to hopefully hear a word from the Lord today. But let's pray together as we begin. Father in heaven, we, we are indeed thankful that you call to us, that you know us individually. You call us by name. And I pray, Lord, as we open up the text again, that you would speak to us, that we would hear your voice speaking to our heart, and that we re might respond, really, to your offer of love and grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you brought a Bible with you. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And 1 Samuel chapter 3, um, we're going to pick it up in verse 19 because it's a, it's sort of an a, a interesting and kind of a pivotal verse, if you will, in, in Samuel's life and really in the narrative even of 1 Samuel. And verse 19, it reads like something like this, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and let none of, he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Now we're going to walk through this verse because there's a lot going on here. Um, the first thing that we notice is, is your Bible might say something like the Lord was with Samuel. And it, different translations do different things. But, but the reality was that, is that God, the Lord, was with Samuel. Not just relationally, but physically. God was present with Samuel. And Samuel then was with the Lord. The Lord was with Samuel in relationship and in proximity also, it seems. And they had repeated visits. How do I know that? Well, it says the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. They had this ongoing relationship with one another. There was a, a personal give and a personal taking and exchange, if you will, in that relationship. Young people ought to especially pay attention here uh, because when you respond positively to the Lord's calling in your life, like Samuel has done here, the Lord will be with you. The Lord will continue to converse with you throughout your life. He'll abide with you is the word that some folk like to use. In other words, he's going to make his presence known in your life. God will show up for you. Samuel had many opportunities as a young boy to be distracted by all of the, all of the nonsense, frankly, that was taking place around him. You'll remember that there was other priests there, these sons of Eli, who really weren't performing their job well. They were doing all kinds of other things 
that were completely inappropriate, not just for a priest, but for anyone to be doing. And they were doing those things really right there in the temple. And so Samuel could have easily gone down the path of least resistance. He could have easily succumbed to peer pressure and followed those wicked men. And, um, and, and I gotta tell you, the temptation for our young people today is, is thick. There are so many things today that are trying to ensnare our young people. And Samuel could have fallen into those examples of those men instead of following the voice of the living God. And I'm thankful that he made the right choice, aren't you? I, I do know that regardless of how old we are, we too can be very easily distracted. We can take that path of least resistance. I'm thankful that it's never too late to begin to heed the voice of the Lord. It could be that you spent your whole life listening to other people rather than listening to God. It could be that you spent your whole life taking the path of least resistance. Perhaps you've even heard God call to you like he did with Samuel. And God was calling and waiting for you to answer and you sort of just hit the hold button. <laughs> yeah, God, I hear you calling. I know you're needing me to make changes in my life, but let's just put a pause on that for now. I'll get to it later. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm engaged in this right now. I, I, I hear you, but not yet. And maybe you hit the pause button. I did that for a while in my life. I can tell you that Samuel decided that he was going to listen to God. That he was going to hear God. And, and the Lord trusted him with insight and gave him knowledge that he couldn't have gotten anywhere else. Knowledge about future events. Knowledge about present situations. Verse 19 says that as Samuel grew, the Lord let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. What does that mean? Well, it's an old metaphor, really, and it, and it has probably is rooted in precious liquors. And when you spill them on the ground, they're of no use. It could be related to archery terms, where in the hands of a skillful archer, the arrow does not fall to the ground, but meets its intended target. So whether it is related to liquor or arrows, it's up for debate. But I can tell you that the verse says that, that the Lord let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And that word word, that gets translated word in most translations, um, it's related to, thing, to something. That, that's a, this Hebrew concept, see? That word that's used there, it actually connects words with action. And, and in other words, by implication... When the Bible says he let none of Samuel's words fail or fall to the ground, he let none of his actions fail either. It's interesting, isn't it, that the Hebrew would connect words and actions? You see, the idea is the things you say you do are the things you actually do. See? It, it's, there's no bit of hypocrisy in the Hebrew. If you say you're going to do something, then you actually do it. See, that's the idea. So whatever Samuel said, or by implication, whatever act he performed it was, that was connected to those sayings, it came to pass because the Lord was with him. Because the Lord gave Samuel those words. The words Samuel spoke were the words given to him by God. And so the Lord made sure that those words didn't fail. And as a result of this, when you get to verse 20, it says all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, all of Israel recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. If you don't know your geography well in, in that day and age, Dan was the tribe that was the farthest tribe to the north, and Beersheba, the farthest tribe to the south. And so what we're reading here is that from the farthest north to the deepest south, where they said y'all maybe, I don't know, probably didn't say y'all, in southern Israel, they do around here in the southern U.S., they say you guys up north, right? Some places they say Ewans, I think. I, I've never said that. Anybody in here ever say that? Ewans? It's right. What's that? It's not right. <laughs> not right. It's not right. All I know is that everywhere in Israel, they all knew that Samuel was a prophet. They knew it because his words didn't fail, because his actions were consistent with his words. And so the end result was that everyone knew that he was a prophet. Now, a prophet is someone who hears from God 
and then repeats what God has said or demonstrates what God has said. As a prime example, if you just go a few verses up in that same chapter, chapter 3, look at verse 10 and following. The Lord came and stood there, calling to him at the other time, saying, Samuel, Samuel. And so this is really the fourth time that God calls Samuel in this passage. And Samuel says, speak, for your servant is listening. Eli told him to say that, and he said it. And look what happens, verse 11 and following. The Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. The Lord's saying, I'm done. Okay? Verse 15, Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. You can see why. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. And Samuel said, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. You notice here that Samuel received a direct message from God. And even though it was difficult and awkward, even though he knew it was going to upset Eli probably very greatly, even though it was really a message of judgment against the high priest, he didn't fail to deliver the message. He didn't pretty it up or sugarcoat it. He gave it to him. And the main reason, you'll notice, for this particular judgment, the main reason Eli is being judged is that he knew about sins in his family. He needed nothing about them. That morning, Eli called Samuel. He wanted to know about what the Lord had told him, and Samuel told him everything. And it must have been a really strange position for Eli to be in. He's the high priest, and instead of the Lord telling him, he's telling him through this boy. It's as though the Lord has already acknowledged Samuel as high priest, even though he doesn't have the office. If Eli didn't know before Samuel's conversation with him, he certainly knew afterwards that simply possessing a religious title it's not the same as possessing a relationship with the Lord. And knowing about sin, for Eli, the sin was that he blasphemed God, or his sons at least blasphemed God, and he failed to constrain them. Failure to correct his children from committing blasphemy. His children, lest we forget, were priests in the temple. All of them, Eli included, were supposed to be God's representatives. And yet blasphemy is being committed by some and winked at by others. You can see maybe why the Lord was done. If you remember, we discovered earlier that Eli's sons, they don't even know God. You can read that, by the way, in chapter 2, verse 12. And the NIV, I like the way it puts it. It says, Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. And, and so Eli is being held responsible for the sin of not only holding his children accountable for their behavior towards God, but for really doing nothing about it at all. Parents today have their own set of challenges. And what a challenging time it is to be the parent of young people. So many young things, uh, so many things really are, are vying for the attention of young people today. And most of them aren't good, frankly. Parents must not only be examples of righteousness, but they must also lovingly correct their children and hold them accountable for their words and their actions. In doing so, you play a part in saving them for eternity. This role of parenthood today is crucial. Crucial. And yet so many of the adults I knew, frankly, the adults I know, they just weren't parented well. And some of you in here can attest to that. Some, some folks I've talked to were treated very harshly when they were children, felt, felt very little love. Some people were, some of you in here were just spoiled rotten. 
didn't really have any consequences at all to your actions, either disciplined too much or disciplined not at all. And, and this, this spectrum of things that happen in between. As a result, many parents today struggle because they didn't have a good example of parenthood. They struggle with setting boundaries. And when they do set a boundary, they struggle with giving their children consequences for breaching those boundaries when they willfully go outside of them. <clears throat> Notice the book of Proverbs. I wonder if you'd turn there with me for a minute. I love the book of Proverbs, by the way. It was really the first book I read when I actually began to read scripture. And, um, and the book of Proverbs, which is a wisdom book, quite Technically, that's what it's classified as, is a wisdom book written by Solomon. And I want you to notice something. This is a little introduction, Proverbs chapter 1. That's where we're going. <coughs> There's a little introduction that kind of describes what you're going to expect in Proverbs. But really, the very first teaching in the book of Proverbs, it's in Proverbs chapter 1. It really begins in verse 8. But really, the first instruction in here has to do with parents and children. Interesting. Listen to this. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. The very first counsel in the entire book of Proverbs is an instruction for children to obey their parents. Because life is going to be better if you do. Someone may well say, well, it doesn't really say obey. It just says listen. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. I want you to know that, that Shema is that first word in Hebrew. And, and that word actually means to listen, hear, obey. It means all three of those words. Because in the Hebrew mind, if you're listening to your parents and you're hearing them, you're obeying them. The same as if you're listening, hearing, and obeying an elder. Or listening, hearing, and obeying God. You see, the reality is in the Hebrew mind that when you listen to someone that's over you in authority, you actually obey what they do. Isn't that a novel thought? <laughs> that you're actually obedient to the voice of God or obedient to those people that God has set in charge of you. So when you read that, when it says, listen, my son, it's also saying, obey, my son. Obey, my son. Eli is told through the prophetic utterance, of this boy, Samuel, that he and his family are doomed chiefly because they blasphemed and he hasn't held them accountable. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not a very pleasant message and it's probably not a very pleasant message to deliver either. But Samuel delivers it anyway. Because he is a faithful prophet willing to share the word of the Lord, or Samuel chapter 3 again, even when it's not easy to share it, you find in verse 21 that the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. That's where the temple was at this time. That's where, he, that's where he appeared to Samuel. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And so the Lord continues to appear to Samuel, continues to reveal himself to Samuel through his word. Now, some may say, well, it must have been an amazing thing to hear directly from God. And it must have been. To be in the very presence of God, right? And, and to hear God calling your name, a personalized message just for you so that you begin to know God as this up close and personal God. And I want you to know that you can have that same experience with God today. And this is the challenge that some people face. The, the reality is, is that this book right here contains the word of God. And I shouldn't use that word contains because God's word can't be contained, can it? No, I, maybe I should say showcases because that's really what it does. That this, this book showcases God's word. It, it reveals God's word to us. And I am convinced that when you spend time in this word, you hear from God. God's word will begin to speak to you personally. Now, I've never heard God's voice audibly, but I've heard him call to me inwardly. Anybody else ever hear God call to you inwardly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he does that. God speaks to us. He, he speaks to our heart. He, he puts thoughts in our minds. And, and those thoughts become very relevant and real the more you spend time in the book. Some people say, how come we don't hear from God? Probably because we're not in this enough, frankly. This book 
I can tell you, you spend enough time reading this book, it'll change your perspective of life, of love, of, of all kinds of things in your life. It, it begin to shape your thinking, and if you let it, it will begin to mold your character. And you'll be a different person than you are maybe even now. You begin to develop, as Samuel did, you begin to develop this personal relationship with God. I have people ask me, how do I have a personal relationship with God? I was, well, you, first of all, you got to start hanging out with God. <laughs> That's the first thing you got to do. Maybe quit hanging out with those other people and start hanging out with God. Because you really want a real relationship with God, a real personal relationship, one that's unique to your experience, I can tell you the word of God will meet you where you are. That's what he does. God meets us where we are. And then you begin a journey of faith with God that will take you to places you've never been. And that's the beauty of it. You begin to grow in wisdom and grace. How do you have a relationship with God? Well, it starts with reading his word and listening to what he is saying. And when we're listening, according to the Hebrew, what are we doing? We're obeying. See? It becomes a natural, intrinsic part of who you are. The more you listen to God, the more you intrinsically begin to obey God. Why? Because hearing is listening. And listening is obeying. That's the idea. Some people may tell you they have a personal relationship with God. And it, and it comes by spending time in nature, just communing with God in nature. Some people have, have told me, well, I have a personal relationship with God. And it comes through just communing with God through prayer. Some people say, well, I connect with God through acts of service. And I can tell you, all of those are great spiritual practices. And I'm, I'm not going to knock any of that. But there's nothing like connecting with God in his word. There's nothing like it. Because God reaches us there in a way, frankly, that you're going to have a hard time connecting with him other places. You find wisdom in God's word. You find grace in God's word and mercy and truth. And here we find the very heart of God poured out for us, showing us the great depths that love is willing to go to redeem us. We discover God's heart. And I got to tell you, when you encounter God's heart for yourself, the way Samuel did. Yeah, God, what do you, what do you need? And, and he began this faith journey with God. And, and when, you, when you begin to discover the truth for yourself, that God really is a God of love, and that God actually is for you and not against you, see? When you begin to discover that, you, you realize that God actually desires good things for you. That God wants the best for you, not just, not just mediocre, nothing. He wants the best for you. He's given, frankly, the best for you. That's when you begin to develop a personal relationship with God. But I got to tell you, it won't happen if you're not in the Word. It, it won't happen if you're not in prayer. It won't happen unless you begin to take steps to make it happen. And I got to tell you, with all of the distractions in the world today, and there are many of them, social media and all of these other things, in the world, politics, all of that stuff. There's so many distractions, so many things you can invest your time in. I gotta tell you, the best time you're gonna invest in here on planet Earth is this. Spending time in the book. Spending time getting to know your creator. Because once you find that personal connection with God, nothing else will compare. Amen. Nothing else will. Nothing else will fulfill the need you have for closeness with God than God himself. And people try all kinds of things to fill that void in their life. I'm missing something in my life. Yeah, you are. It's God. And I've met people that have tried to fill that void with all kinds of things. And maybe you're one of them. Drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, all, all kinds. Nothing is going to fill the void. Except for God. So today, I present to you the word of God. It's your first and best hope. Uh, that's it. And, and it's not because it's written in some version or what. I don't care what version you read. I frankly don't. But because it reveals a God. It reveals a God who is a God of love. A God who is leaning in to save us. Who is desperate, frankly, to save us. And so my prayer and my hope is that you'll make time. The reality is this. All of us are busy. Anybody in here not busy? Everybody's busy. Carter's not busy. Carter's got time. 
I want to be like Carter. <laughs> All of us are busy. I hear people that people have told me before, and then they backed up a little bit. People have told me, Pastor, I'm, I'm so busy, I don't have time to pray. Think about that. If you're too busy to pray, the enemy has you right where he wants you. If you're too busy to spend some time in scripture, the enemy has you right where he wants you. Shut off the television, get off social media. Do you know these cell phones actually have a way to shut them off? Did you know that? It's an amazing thing. You can shut that thing off. You actually can. And nothing bad will happen, trust me. Some good things might actually happen. Whatever you need to do to realign your schedule so that you have time for God in his word, you need to do it, whatever that is. And it may be different, it probably is for every one of us. But I can tell you the end result of that may be something that you've never experienced before, an actual personal relationship with the living God. And I can't tell you anything else on planet Earth that's gonna be as powerful as that. So I wanna encourage you today. And I want to challenge you today to take some time, rearrange your schedule if you need to, and you might, so that you're prioritizing things that actually matter instead of mindlessly scrolling through Facebook or whatever it is you're doing. God desires intimate relationship with you. Samuel didn't have an exclusive on that. You know, Samuel wasn't the only one who had a real relationship with God. The Bible's full of people who had real relationships with God and you can have one too. But you have to be intentional and you have to try. And if you're willing to try today, I wonder if you'll just slip your hand up so I can pray for you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, just want to thank you for, for this little example in scripture of a boy who recognized that, that a relationship with you was priority in his life. What a challenge for us adults and, and the young people among us to maybe reprioritize our lives so that you truly are first place. We want, Father, to hear from you. We need you to guide our hearts and guide our lives. And so we pray, Lord, that you would inspire us or maybe re-inspire us so that we can truly spend some meaningful time in the pages of the book so that we can grow in our personal relationship with you. Father, bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 185 in the hymnal, 185. The words will be up on the screen for you. It's a song I think that you probably have sung before. Jesus is all the world to me. You know that one? Yeah, let's stand together and sing it. 185. <laughs>